Welcome to the Gruber Morning Show. This is the Artificial Future Podcast, where we talk about artificial intelligence. So again, thanks for joining us. The uh, picture behind me is an AI-generated image of a robot that is uh, weeding and uh, taking care of tulips in the Netherlands. Remember, the Netherlands is a, is a huge uh, tulip grower. And uh, among other vegetables, by the way, they, um, they have uh, managed to uh, turn their country into one of the uh, largest growing uh, centers on the planet. But anyway, we'll talk about that later a bit, and, um, but that's what you're looking at. It's a gigantic robot, it looks like, uh, doing some work out in the fields, replacing farmers, hopefully, or maybe, I don't know. So um, yesterday, um, you know, there's usually something in the... Yeah. Your mic is a little too far, far away. All right, how's far, that? Yeah. Better? Um, there's usually something in AI news that just takes my breath away. And um, it almost happens daily nowadays because there's it's such a rapid advancement of uh, technology and uh, uh, capabilities. But uh, <clears throat> uh, yesterday I was watching Jesse scribble down some notes on a notepad, you know, one of those eight and a half by 11 type, the big spiral pound um, uh, wound. And... Uh, I thought to myself, um, you know, he's definitely from a generation that doesn't really manually write anything. And I made a joke and I said, hey, what are you regressing or something? And uh, I said, no, I just wanted to try the notepad. And uh, it looked like what he was doing was uh, cursive writing. Um, I, I don't think I can do that anymore, by the way. But um, anyway, his chicken scratchings were a combo of cursive arrows pointing at paragraphs. Uh, there was some asterisks in there to highlight points. And uh, personally, I would have had trouble reading it, but it was Jesse's personal notes. So I figured it had value for him. Well, I found out later on a lark, he decided to take a picture of this, of this notepad with his cell phone uh, with lousy lighting, some, you know, too much shadows and stuff. And then he asked ChatGPT4 to transcribe it. And the results were jaw-dropping. It was amazing. It replicated the asterisks, it replicated the arrows, and uh, it seemed to have no trouble at all deciphering his chicken scratching cursive. So again, just blown away by the capabilities of this, uh, of this software and this new technology. And that probably is the reason that it's able to decode old Sanskrit scripts and uh, uh, clay tablets and uh, maybe even the Ten Commandments. Are those around? Or Joseph Smith's tablets that he found up on Hill Camorra in Palmyra, New York, a couple hundred years ago or so. Um, of course, I think those were in English, so we don't have to transcribe those. But we have to convert them to other languages, perhaps. All right. The Mormons may have already done that. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Shoot, even your doctor's notes. I went to the doctor the yep. other day, and I, and I saw her prescription, some stuff that she wrote down for the lady for the front desk, and I couldn't understand a word that she wrote down. Couldn't yeah. read it, couldn't understand it. I have no idea what it was. AI. Yep. Amazing stuff. All right. Um, those of you that have any questions, inputs, we love to hear from you guys. Um, this is an interactive podcast. I don't have all the answers. I have opinions. You may have some opinions. We'd love to hear from you. And the first one coming through is a TikTok uh, audience member. Deal Doe is his name. And he says, why always the sunglasses? Well, uh, it's part of our image. It um, may be hiding things such as our red glowing eyes because we're really AI. Um, and we have a whole bunch of other hypotheses for this, but we decided early on there are some valid reasons for it. One of these days we're going to do a video. We're going to release why there are always sunglasses involved in the Gruber Productions, uh, but we're not ready yet. So in the meantime, put on your own sunglasses. Join us. Maybe you'll get a fuller experience that way. In the meantime, the sunglasses will remain a mystery. Happy in here, I got the, uh, let me pull this up. All right. I'm going to minimize you just a smidge here. Something coming from Jesse's corner, so stay tuned. Oh, there's your uh, chicken here's scratching. The, yeah, here's the note. So here's the original note. Yeah. Page. And so I just took this picture with my cell phone, and you see the lighting's all off. There's a bunch of shadows all over it. Some of the words you can't even really tell. I uploaded it directly to ChatGPT. 
and it perfectly transcribed all of it, including with the arrows and the asterisks and all of that. So it's blown away. Were um did it misspell any of the words? No. That is amazing. Now on its own, it can't do that. You know, you tell it, I want a, a building that has Tesla on the uh, on the uh, front of the building, and it will butcher up the word Tesla badly at times. But uh, apparently doing rote processes like this where it's deciphering your stuff has no issue at all. Well, the only thing, too, when you ask it to give you an answer, it can spit out a 10,000-word answer, and there's no misspellings in that either. Yeah, yeah. It's in the graphics portion linked it's, to yeah, it. Yeah, only in... Where, Creating graphics, yeah. Yeah. All right, have something else for you here. And I, um, I read this last week, and I, I need to share this. Um, can we throw up a picture here? The picture's called Waiting. And what you're going to see here is um, a bunch of um, uh, religious-type uh, representatives that are uh, looking up at the sky. And you can see various uh, denominations there. Um, and uh, anyway, the text goes like this. Hindus have been waiting for Kalki for 3,700 years. Buddhists have been waiting for Maitreya for 2,600 years. The Jews have been waiting for the Messiah for 2,500 years. Christians have been waiting for Jesus for 2,000 years. To come back, by the way. Sunna waits for Prophet Isa for 1,400 years. Muslims have been waiting for a Messiah from the line of Muhammad for 1,300 years. Shiites have been waiting for Iman Mahdi for 1,080 years. Druze have been waiting for Hamza ibn Ali for 1,000 years. Most religions adopt the idea of a savior and state that the world will remain filled with evil until the savior comes and fills it with goodness and righteousness. The rest of this is, maybe our problem on this planet is that people expect someone else to come and solve their problems instead of doing it themselves. I could go on a rant here, but I'll just do a few, all right? These statistics say that 15,000 children have died with this Hamas-Israeli conflict. The thing that's going on in Ukraine, never thought that would happen again in this century. I thought we have evolved beyond that. So my personal vote on this has been all along that uh, the people on this planet cannot manage to run this planet. The analogy that I like to use, it's, it's like the parents went on vacation, left the house to the kids, and the kids have partied it to the ground and the parents are coming back home. And you know who those parents are going to be, in my opinion? AI overlords. What we need is someone more intelligent than us to finally put this planet and humanity back on track. And that's, that's going to be somebody that's smarter than us because a whole lot of smart people on this planet continue to make the same stupid mistakes that they've been making for thousands of years. We're still killing each other, you know, annihilating each other. There's genocide on the planet for frivolous, ludicrous reasons, absolutely ridiculous reasons. So I embrace and welcome AI coming in and guiding us. Again, my notion on this is not like the Terminator movies where you have killer robots and you've got evil, uh, you know, uh, entities, AI entities potentially coming into play. Anything smarter than us is not going to behave like us and act like us and uh, kill mankind. Uh, the most intelligent people are generally the least violent. If you take a look at the violence scale, the lower you go on the IQ rating, the more violence you end up with. So my vote is, let's let the AI overlords evolve. Let's let them eventually come in and uh, stop waiting for all of these um, deities that may or may not come and give us um, a, a planet filled with goodness and righteousness. We can start that process and then follow the lead of AI overlords, which will guide us into how to keep it that way and make it even more of a utopian future for us and our children. All right, that was a good rant, guys.
At least I thought so. And if you thought so, let me know. Randolph Schnack's coming in. He's saying, got my free full self-driving. It's been fun trying it out. How do you like 12.3? Personally, I don't drive it. Um, I am the official Tesla Roadster test driver for Gruber Motor Company, and we repair so many cars, I'm constantly <laughs> test driving a Tesla Roadster. I don't think I've been in my uh, P90D Ludacris for a couple of years now. Is it up and running though? No. no. Didn't they take <laughs> it apart? The <laughs> when, when I park my car over at Gruber Motor Company, they suddenly look attractively like parts cars to the guys. And there's always something that gets removed that they intend to put back on there, but doesn't quite get done. But, um, you know, I've heard good things, Randolph, about this new full self driving. Uh, although yesterday, I think we had a video. Is that something we can bring up, Jesse? Or. Um, uh, the one where it's going over the yellow lines, uh, the double lines. It's fundamentally what this video revealed was that uh, this new full self-driving uh, software is very much like human driving. Now, instead of the hundreds of thousands of lines of rule-based code that it was trying to, um, uh, to use previously, so you're probably going to see some California stops at the stop signs. Hopefully no red light runners because they promised us that they only took the best drivers out of their pool of uh, data that they had collected to make this uh, new version of full self-driving. <clears throat> Here we go. Now it's doing something it's not supposed to do. Notice that double solid yellow line. And then gets, uh, uh, yeah, just stays in that lane. Much more like human drivers, if you think about it. What I'm really hoping is that uh, this new full self, this new full self driving, will also adhere to certain lane disciplines, which seems to be absent in this country. I mean, you go over to Europe, Germany, especially. There's very strict lane discipline, especially on the autobahn, because you can get killed if you're uh, lollygagging in the passing lane, and you've got cars that are doing 150 plus in that lane trying to pass. If you, we got uh, breaking news here that I got to pull up. All right. You're going to like this one. Breaking news. There we go. You can now edit Dolly images in ChatGPT directly on your cell phone, iOS, uh, Apple phone, or Android phone. Amazing. So it looks like from this video, you ask Dolly in ChatGPT, like always, to make you an image. Then I think you're, he selects the image. Then you can highlight certain parts of the image and prompt it again to now get specific edits of the image. Put, um, uh, put mouse ears on the dog. Oh, add bows. There we go. Okay, there's a good one. And this is all on your cell phone now. Well, it's a, you can do it anywhere, but it's yeah. in ChatGPT is the important part. And here we go, creating image, and let's see what happens to the dog. Does he get, does the poodle get bows is basically what we're going to do here. And does it place them correctly? And this is something that just came across the wire, then I take it. Uh, OpenAI, I just tweeted this um, two minutes ago. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. Look at that. It's the right color, too. It matches the happy birthday sign. So, mm -hmm. again, like I started this, this, this whole podcast, every day... There's a new jaw-dropping something that makes you just go, ooh and ah. This, this Every hour. Every hour now. Okay. All right. I, every every time I open Twitter, there's yeah. some new AI advancement happening. Every time. All right. So here's another news item. Uh, Yahoo is acquiring an in, um, Instagram co-founder's AI-powered news startup called Artifact. And, um, of course, the upshot here is, is that Yahoo is now going to use AI for news. Um, boy, there's a few jobs that might have been eliminated with that move. But the, the, uh, the article goes like this. Yahoo is acquiring Artifact, the AI-powered news app from Instagram co-founders Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger. The company announced on Tuesday. The financial terms of the deal were not disclosed, but Artifact will no longer operate as a standalone application. And its AI-powered personalization technology will be integrated across Yahoo including the Yahoo News app in the coming months. And uh, Yahoo is a TechCrunch, uh, is TechCrunch's parent company. So uh, Sist 
Systrom and Krieger will work with Yahoo in an advisory capacity to make sure that this launch is successful during the transition. The announcement comes a few months after Artifact said it would be winding down its operation as the market opportunity was not big enough to warrant continued investment. Although Artifact started as a simple news app, the end result seemed more like a Twitter replacement, and there are, there are already a lot of those. They say there's a lot of competition in that space with numerous challengers, including Meta's threads. So Artifact, um, the uh, technology within Artifact surfaces content users want to see and becomes more attuned to their interests over time. So it's learning, in other words, what you like to see, a biofeedback uh, process, it sounds like. And as a result, uh, users receive personalized feed of news stories that they want to read. It will summarize, there's some tools, it will summarize news rewrite clickbait headlines, and surface the best content. Um, it, they, uh, they do go to point out that AI is probably the best curator and um, that this is going to alter Yahoo News dramatically. What do you um, think about that, Pete, with the personalization? Have you, have you experienced that? I don't know how often you use TikTok at home or just in your personal life, but I hate it. When I'm scrolling through TikTok... Okay. TikTok knows how long you spend on each video. So if I yeah. see a video that I wouldn't normally watch, like I get a lot of police chases or something, yeah. and I just get interested in one and I sit there and I watch it for more than five seconds, all of a sudden every video is a police chase. Completely. And uh, yeah, it's been my experience as well. For example, I watched one uh, lion dismembering a warthog. Oh, yeah, those are those are brutal. Yeah. And this thing is screaming its head off. I didn't <laughs> want to see that again. You know, I mean, it's it's pretty brutal. Exactly. And suddenly all I'm seeing is tigers, lions, eating monkeys, attacking giraffes. Mm -hmm. You know, the best one, I think, was when it attacked a zebra. And zebras, apparently, I didn't I didn't know this, have never been domesticated zebras? by the Africans. Zebras. <laughs> And you think, why? I mean, it's the size of a horse. Yeah. Why not uh, domesticate it, ride it, uh, plow your garden with it, whatever, right? Uh, pull buggies, you know, uh, take it to Amish country. Apparently, zebras are uh, wired a bit differently. They're very aggressive. And uh, anyway, this zebra was being chased by a, a pretty sizable lion, and it did a back kick that would have uh, put, uh, you know, anybody to sleep. Yeah. But anyway, you're absolutely right. I've seen right. those giraffes, too. I've seen giraffes stomp the crap out of some. Yeah. They, they yeah. go crazy with those long legs. Yeah. That's crazy, especially on those lions. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. Uh, then I was watching some Bavarian girls that were in one of these turning. They call it the Teufelsrat, which means devil's wheel. And um, so they're all sitting there in the middle with their dirndls, which is a Bavarian form of dress. And uh, this thing starts to turn, and they're slowly getting spun off of the center of this uh, wheel. Well, I don't think I can see a TikTok, uh, you know, series anymore without at least a couple of those in any of those threads because I watched it that right. one time. Right. Well, so that's the thing, though. How does it? How does it know? It doesn't. I think that I'm. I'm wondering if Artifact, because I couldn't find any info. I tried to look. I wonder if it has some other method of determining what you like aside from how long you spend on a video because that's been around forever on yeah. all on all these social platforms it's the same on instagram reels the same on facebook watch if you if you if you're flipping through with your thumb on your cell phone and you stop for more than a few seconds on one of them it registers that as that's the content that you like so uh there there has to be a more sophisticated way for it to know what we like because that's not that's not indicative of what we actually like well, it would be pretty creepy if it was able to use facial recognition and see the expression on my face as I'm watching something. See, I don't, I don't see why it wouldn't be able <laughs> to. Though. I use yeah. my phone, uh, the face <laughs> unlock feature. It already can read my face, right? So, yeah. why wouldn't I just give that app permissions to do that, and then it would know more accurately? But then, how does it know? You know, if I'm grimacing at something, then maybe I will engage with that more. Maybe it's purposefully feeding me things that it knows I will engage with, not necessarily things that I like. You, you don't emotional. always engage. Yeah. yeah. You it's, don't always engage with what you like. It could be something you don't like. It's looking for an emotional reaction now, a good or uh, bad. So, yeah. 
Um, uh, Stephen Rose joined us. Welcome, Stephen. He says, I have also had the misspelling issue on graphics using AI. The only thing I can think of is possibly it's done on purpose so people don't use it for commercial purposes. Yeah, possibly. Um, yeah, it, it seems to be too smart. I mean, why, why does it misspell something like Tesla? I mean, how many references to Tesla are there in social media or in media in well, general? Yeah, there's a lot of, you, you would think it would have that kind of register, but the with that thing we just saw where you can edit the images now, we'll have to test it. So if we create an image and it has a misspelling, we'll highlight that and ask it to, re, to you know, redo it. Yep. Randolph Schnack says, I looked for tires online and bought my tires a month ago. All my ads are still for tires. Yeah. Uh, Facebook's mm -hmm. the same way. Suddenly things start popping up that uh, you've curated or that it's curating for you. Well, I think on Instagram, I think you can click the three dots or something and you can see show me less of this. Can oh, you really? not do that on TikTok? Well, I have no idea. Yeah. yeah maybe search for that. Yeah. yeah. Joseph Liss is joining us. He says, with artificial intelligence, you could mimic somebody, I know's voice on the phone. Absolutely. I think one of our uh, topics here today is going to be a, a continuation of the, um, of the voice recognition and then um, uh, honing in on that with intonation, uh, accent, all of that. Um, AI is definitely uh, getting into a number of different areas. One of them, which is the Apple, uh, the first Big Vision Pro update, shared experiences, spatial personas, they call it. Got an image of this one, Jesse. It's called Apple, just simple Apple. And um, there is a brief video uh, floating on Twitter. It was a Marcus Brownlee post that uh, this guy, by the way, gets all his stuff for free. And uh, we, we would love to be recipients of that as well. Um, but anyway, he, he is um, he's talking about um the uh spatial persona capability there we go oh you've got the video yeah there's no sound to it but yeah now you jesse can... you were saying that in order to get this face the uh -huh. goggles are actually reading your just face? scanning your face yeah there's some kind of sensors inside of the vision pro headset uh, and I think you actually, when you first set up the headset, you have to build this profile and let it scan your face and, and do this stuff. So Okay, so it's not just while you're wearing it because well, all you see no, is your eyes. Well, no, no, it is doing it while you're wearing it because you can see it, they're making facial expressions and it's reading and showing their facial oh, expressions. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's showing their mouth moving, it's showing their eyes blinking, it's showing, it's it's reading all of that. Right, right. That's not fake, It's that's actually capturing it somehow. I don't I don't know how, but... yeah. Soon to be revealed, I'm sure. But uh, what? Um, so what Marcus is saying, this was at the top of my list of what was missing from Vision Pro. The floating head is a little odd looking, but the principle is there. Interact with the same content slash game slash object as someone else in real time. Very cool. All right. So here we are. And my comment to this was blurring and tweaking reality one step at a time. All right, here's another headline. Um, the um, AI will soon be making full featured movies. We've already seen some of the teasers with that, with um, Sora, uh, which is able to uh, create uh, videos based on prompts. Sona creates, or Suna creates music. Suno. Suno, based yeah. on prompts. I'll at least start with S. All right, well, at least those two. But um, what they're saying here is, that the uh, Hulk and Wolverine uh, movies may be the first, and entire movies will soon easily be made with artificial intelligence. Well, we have uh, Tyler Perry, too, from canceling his studio production. Yeah. You know? So he's a massive director. He's made, I think, some, something crazy. He's been part of like 45 films, and he's only in his mid-40s or something, so he's got a while to go. And with over an $800 million, almost a billion-dollar investment in this studio in Georgia... Uh -huh. I'm sure there were investors that saw this, got skittish, and said, oh, we're pulling funding. Um, you know, why do we want to invest a billion dollars of our money if the capabilities from AI are going to replace a lot of this? So my comment here was, look out, SAG-AFTRA. SAG-AFTRA, by the way, the Screen Actors Guild and American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. It's an American labor union that just went on strike, if you remember, end of last year. 
And uh, a lot of demands came out of that, a lot of uh, AI concerns, a lot of restrictions in the new contract. Well, guess what, guys? This, these, these contracts may be null and void because they're not going to need any actors in the future. Um, the uh, 2012 merger of SAG and, and um, uh, AFTRA is a reason those two are combined, and it represents approximately 160,000 media professionals worldwide. SAG AFTRA is also a member of the AFL CIO uh, union, which is the largest federation of unions in the United States. So, unions? Yeah, the unions are in trouble. Um, but Pete, we're, we're in the moment where we're waiting for the first great AI film. Think yes. about that. Yes. So, yeah. there, there is no barrier for entry for distribution because you have the internet now, right? right. Before you would have to go through the you know traditional distribution through the studios and all of that. Uh, now at any at any moment someone could come out with the first great animated fully AI actors, AI voice actors, AI script, AI everything, full mm -hmm. AI production. One person can make a the the first real new Hollywood essentially uh, film. And basically, if you're creating prompts, it could be another young teenager, Steven Spielberg, in his bedroom making blockbuster movies like this. If you think about it, CGI was probably our first uh, step in this direction. If, um, to create a blockbuster movie, you have salaries uh, for the support staff. You have these ridiculous salaries for these movie stars, Hun you know, uh, millions of dollars, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. Sometimes they get cuts to the box office, everything. Exactly, cut afterwards. Then you have travel expenses. This was shot in um, Costa Rica because they wanted a jungle setting. No longer need to do that. Uh, all the extras that are involved, the set uh, construction, I mean, you've got literally, they're, they're, they're building, you know, the Wild West type cities, for example. And there's an enormous amount of lumber involved and uh, construction equipment and all that. Well, no, no, no. Imagine an actor gets hurt. Oh, my God. Ima yeah. Imagine an actor <laughs> is sick one day when you yeah. have a 10-hour day of shooting scheduled. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you're right. All of this is going away. And uh, the distribution method... Um, I'm not sure that people are going to go to theaters anymore, especially with what we're able to do I was going to tell you that. Homes. I went to Dune 2, okay? Yeah. And this is the first movie I've gone to in a year because I just don't like going out to theater anymore. It's just not... I can watch everything on a much higher definition TV at home. Yeah. You know, I paid a lot of money for my TV. It looks a lot better than the, the screen at a movie theater. Combined with a good audio system and you've replicated or exceeded what you're going to get in the theater mm -hmm. because you're in one seat in this gigantic uh, hall, you know. Well, not only that, but I went to the theater and I got in there and it was packed full of people. Not a people person, don't like that. Right. The seat that I was sitting in had uh, butter stains from the last popcorn that the person <laughs> had in the theater in the movie before me. Right. There's trash all over the floor. The floor was sticky there from was, the last yeah, soda that got spilled. There were long <laughs> lines. The trash in the bathroom was overflowing. Right. And then the other thing is I have to get up in the middle of the movie and go watch or go to the walk to the bathroom. I can't pause it. Oh, right. Yeah, that's So I true. missed, you know, five or ten minutes of the movie that I just paid $20 for. Yeah. So my opinion is theaters are dead. For me, they're dead. I'm not. The Dune Two is the one exception where I'd go because everybody was saying it was great, it has great reviews. Really liked the first one. I easily could have waited for that to come out after the fact. I was thinking that to myself. I could have waited for this. You know, our um, our com group makes custom cabling products, and um, we were actually approached by a, a movie theater chain, Harkins, now out of business, by the way, um, for a custom uh, projector mount. They, it, uh, it was a wall mount type thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had changed projectors in a lot of these. Um, they had upgraded to the newest, latest technology, and it required different mounting methods. Anyway, to make a long story short, we were making these for Harkins, uh, and then eventually AMC came along. We started making them for them as well, same projector, you know, same upgrade. And then COVID hit, and mm -hmm. these guys got hit hard. Yeah, No one was going to go to a large room, like you're saying, with a potentially a whole lot of people rebreathing the same air, you know, touching the same surfaces they touched. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I think they started to die during COVID. So, but it, I remember as a kid, I remember being different, though. I don't know if it was just 
because technology was different, but I remember going with my family to see the first Jurassic Park, the second Jurassic Park in the 90s, and Star going Wars. to see yeah. s- the the Star Wars remakes w- w- were mine in 2000, and going to see The Matrix, and I remember these massive, and it was an event. You would go there, yeah. there's these long queuing lines, and there, it was it's just different. I don't understand. It's just not the same now. And there's a social thing, too. I went to the Rocky Horror Picture Show one night. It was like at 1 a.m. in the morning or something like that. And uh, people were uh, dressing up as the characters. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. Everything's changing, folks. Get ready. Joseph Liss says, My opinion, there's more bad and evil corruption and deceit than it's worth. Well, good point. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that I'm sold on. We need AI overlords. We need the parents to come back home. Uh, we've destroyed the house, and we're continuing to, and uh, we, there is no second house. That's a big problem, right? We get this planet. Now, granted, at some point we may have space travel, but have you seen these places that we're supposed to be going to? They're inhospitable. You can't even go out and breathe the air. You can't go out and enjoy a sunrise or sunset. You know, well, see, that actually changes, and I'll, this is my plug where I get to talk about fusion. Yeah. Because once we have... Uh achieve the, the ability to do fusion, not only will it give us the power to get to these distant places, but a fusion reactor is what's needed to terraform those planets as well, ah, to heat okay. them up and yeah. create an atmosphere. and do all, You need infinite power, essentially, to, to make something like that happen. Now, there's an interesting Quickly. notion. We're actually going to convert these other planets to our biological needs, mm-hmm. a certain temperature range, a certain amount of oxygen in the air, and yeah. other, uh, you know... So but the other thing is, though, which one do you think will come first? Because if we have a fusion reactor and we can do that and we can take it from a thousand years to terraform a planet down to maybe a hundred years, that's still a very long time mm-hmm. to, to, to terraform it properly and get it to where it's livable. Uh, I think we're going to reach the point where we take our consciousness and stick it in a machine far before then. Then we won't, we won't need to terraform a planet. We don't need to terraform, yeah. Because yeah. we don't have to breathe anything, so... Uh, Joseph Liss says, crisis management, when something happens, that's when you deal with it myself. Okay. All right. Um, here's a good article. And this one's close to, um, uh, uh, near and dear to my heart. AI, it says, tastes beer and then tells the brewers how to make it better. Um, these were apparently AI designed beers uh, that were then preferred in a blind taste test. You know, the Pepsi challenge and all that. Well, AI created some beer, and people preferred it to what these brewers have been, uh, you know, creating. And where I'm from, in Bavaria, these guys have been brewing beer for a thousand years, literally, you know. Old convents, uh, Weichstefana, for example, outside of Munich, uh, they're going to have their thousand-year anniversary in the year 1040. And one of my goals is I'm going to be there. I'm going to go, no matter how old I am, I don't let the old man in. So, mm. you know, <laughs> I will be there. Um, so, it's coming up soon. Yeah. So, AI that predicts how to improve the taste of beer could help brewers develop the next beloved brew, they say, uh, and avoid having their creations poured down the kitchen sink. So, this was the beer challenge. All beers share the same basic ingredients grain, hops, yeast, and water. But between the different varieties and the, of the basic ingredients, different alcohol contents and optional special ingredients. And now we get into the additives like fruits, spices. Brewers have a near infinite number of flavor combinations they can try when developing a new beer. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into the beer uh, preferences here with you guys. In Bavaria, there is a very strict beer purity law which says that you can't add anything, you can't filter it, you can't uh, tweak it, you know, do anything to it. So the skill then becomes selecting the right yeast to get the flavor that you want. I'm looking and, it up. And the water. Um, and here in the U.S., when I get a Bavarian equivalent, like a good uh-huh. Hefeweizen, right? Yeah. Uh, they will flavor that thing, and I can taste it. It doesn't taste authentic to me. Um, so the purists, I guess I'm a wine, con- there, there are wine connoisseurs, I'm a beer connoisseur. You're, and I can uh, tell when it's not done in the traditional method, in the Bavarian method. Here in the U.S., so people drink that stuff and I think it's just terrific, right? You're an but elitist, I, Pete. I, yeah. I, I, I beer so. elitist. Here, look at this real quick on the screen. Sure. Yeah. It says it's all the way back April 15, 16 is mm-hmm. when they originally did the Bavarian... Uh, 
the beer purity laws. The laws that say only water, barley, and hops are allowed to be used as key ingredients. Yep, and that tradition remains, and of course their beers are outstanding, excellent. So to help them know when they've landed on a winner with beer, they might ask trained beer experts to judge their new creations. But tasting sessions can be expensive, and panelists' opinions are very subjective. I just gave you an example of that. I have some subjective biases about what I prefer and what I will drink and not drink in, in uh, the realm of beer. So they say once the session is over, the brewer might know what the experts did or didn't like, but they won't necessarily know why or how they might be able to make their beer better. Good point. So again, now we're getting into some jobs that might be replaced. Reviewers, wine uh, reviewers, beer reviewers, scotch, whiskey reviewers. Wait, sorry, what did that say? It said they won't know how to make it better? Yeah, they'll know what the experts preferred, but it doesn't tell them how to I change see. the recipe. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So better beer. They say researchers from KU Leuven in Belgium have now trained an AI to predict how much people will like a beer and how a recipe could be tweaked to increase the drinker's enjoyment of it. Information, of course, it could be huge, hugely beneficial to brewers. Ah, here's somebody, Joseph Lee, he says, I hope nobody messes with Guinness. Uh -huh. <laughs> First thing we did when my wife and I got to London, um, we went to a little pub, and we had to have our, you know, traditional uh, uh, pints of uh, Guinness stout. Instagram. René Salrud says, greetings from Germany. Thanks for joining us. Sorry about the green screen. For those of you on Instagram, you can't see the, the green screen picture that we have behind us. But again, it is a picture of a gigantic robot in the tulip fields in the Netherlands doing weeding and uh, taking care of pests. And here's one thing I'm going to show that I saw yesterday. Yeah. Because I think, I don't know if it's the same for beer. I'd have to see if there's an image. But I saw this yesterday on uh, Twitter showing the difference in soda and what we allow here versus what they allow in the UK. Yeah. Look at that image. Those are the same brand, same same drink. Yeah. And the one on but the one, left. The is... one on the left is US. It's, yes. Okay. Yeah. It's fully synthetic uh, ingredients versus the one on the right, which is allowed in the UK, which looks like orange juice almost. It does, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the one on the left looks way better to drink than the one on the right. You think? One on the right looks like somebody <laughs> just filled it up with orange juice. Yeah. So, but the the thing is, I think that we allow a lot of dyes and, and synthetic sugars and stuff here that aren't allowed in pretty much the rest of the world. So, it actually is probably a lot healthier to drink the one on the right, but I would agree with you. I like the one on the left. But I like... And of course, that's why it's being sold because they know what you like. Yeah, I like the ones <laughs> yeah. that are cheaper and. I like dye. <laughs> exactly. I like, like my Red 40. You know, one of the things about the Europeans is they don't have the same insatiable need for sugar. It was like um, we had Nicole here for the podcast, the Com Podcast, and she, uh, she put it aptly. She says, I'm from the South and I like a little tea with my sugar. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, in, um, in the European pastries, are typically not as overwhelmingly sweet as they are here in the United States. And it's tough getting used to for those of us from Europe. Any of you want to chime in? Love to hear from you. All right, so here, here's another article. This AI can finally tell humans why we're losing. And um, as you know, um, uh, okay, artificial intelligence has uh, traditionally defeated human champions in a variety of games. The first one was in the last century when Kasparov lost to uh, a chess game to uh, AI. Um, but it turns out that not only can AI now beat human beings in a variety of games, but it's able to tell us why, potentially making us better, I would suppose. So they talk about this... Um, uh, bridge players. By bumping off eight of the world's best bridge players, a new AI has not only claimed a win in one of the games where humans have still held out, but also a victory for other AIs of its type. French startup Nook AI, bridge champ, named uh, NOOK, represents a different kind of AI from the deep learning neural networks, which currently power self-driving cars. Unlock smartphones with your face and dominate in strategy games like Go. While these AIs are capable of delivering results for complex problems, there's a catch. 
we don't know how they do it. It's still a black box, basically. Nukna um, takes a different tack, apparently. It's called neurosymbolic AI, and it combines deep learning with more traditional AI approaches to create algorithms with deep learning strengths that essentially can show their work. What strategy did it use? How did it get there? What was it thinking or not thinking at the time that it beat that human player? They say what we've seen represents a fundamentally important advance in the state of artificial intelligence systems. And this is from Stephen Muggleton, professor of machine learning at Imperial College of London. The black box problem. Deep learning AI is powered by neural networks, as their name suggests. These algorithms take their design cues from the brain. Inside your brain, individual neurons work together as a network to solve complex problems. And deep learning AI does the same thing. By using layer after layer of neural nets, they are capable of turning out solutions to some really difficult beyond human level problems, like finding patterns in data and they excel when given huge amounts of data. All right, looks like um, Stephen Goway is joining us. He says, thank you so much for having this content. 2016 Model S at about 160,000 miles, out of warranty next June. Hope to use your service if needed after that. I would say uh, get on the waiting list now because Model S's are... We're, we're, like starting a year to, out. Yeah, we're, we're starting to clear some backlog, although there's a new twist to all of this. Apparently, there is a huge population of Fisker car owners that are yeah, being left high one. and dry. Well, not, don't forget about the Solos, too. Solos, Mechanica, yep. Although those have mostly been bought back at this point. I don't think the, yeah. the owner population is anywhere near. There's 6,000 Fiskers stateside more outside the country and uh actually you guys were saying this morning that uh, another news item now is the doors oftentimes won't open from the inside or outside now there's a there's serious a new investigation on it yeah oh yeah yeah those NTHSB. cars just be and of course those cars would need to be recalled but recalled to who well where i'm going with this is we're being approached as a potential service delivery um option for some of these cars and uh, that, of course, is going to make us even busier. But a 2016 Model S, uh, yeah, almost out of warranty. You've gotten some good mileage on that, 160,000 miles. Um, generally, they're very reliable cars, so cross your fingers. Stephen Rose says, The Sphere in Vegas, a postcard from Earth, is a movie about people leaving Earth and developing other planets. Very impressive. Did you get a chance to see it? I didn't. No, I have seen a, a lot of stuff. I'll see if I can pull up uh, an image. The Las Vegas Sphere is crazy. It's like the new multi-billion or one one and a half billion dollar thing that they opened. Um, it's essentially a giant screen. You're inside this auditorium with like sixty thousand people, and it's just a giant. The whole entire thing is a giant screen. And it's round. Is that yeah? That it's ball round. That you yep. see that, yeah, that has things on the outside, yeah. like the eyeball from yeah, space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that stuff cool. is crazy. We went there in March of last year when they first opened it up, mm -hmm. and they had like a basketball. They had like you went a in world. It? Not in it. I'm sorry, oh, just on the outside. Saw it? Oh, yeah, because yeah. it wasn't open at that time. But oh, okay. they had the outside working. So yeah. they had uh, like an eyeball blinking, and then they had like a, the world, and then a basketball, and then a smiley face that would actually like interact. It looked like it was following cars. It was it was pretty neat. Oh, here's very cool. Sure. I'm not being rude, Aaron. I've got a sign on the camera that says "Look here," because usually when you're talking, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I hear you. <laughs> oh, there we go. We've got some images coming up. Yeah, this is this is a, a mind blower. This one. Only in Vegas. Yeah. I think that one's just a meme, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but the way it's cutting uh, off at the bottom. This is the inside of it. It's pretty crazy. But the whole entire thing, all the way up to the ceiling, is just a giant screen with thousands of people in there. You know, the first iteration of that, and I hope this isn't before your time, was the IMAX theaters. Do you guys remember yeah. those? So they still yeah. have those. That's what I was going to say when you uh, mentioned earlier that Harkins is... Uh, out of business. They Hold still have it, a yeah. couple of them here, and they have the IMAX at uh, Desert Ridge. Do they? Yeah. Mm, yeah, it's the giant screen. Yeah. I think they still have one at Arizona Mills, too. 
Joseph Liss is saying, I can see developing AI for cancer research. You know, that's what we're all waiting for, is for AI to begin to take over the R&D for a lot of these types of things, not just technology, but for healthcare. And, um, you know, we, we report whenever we get an interesting story, you know, like enzyme identification. Um, AI does so much better a job at that because it reduces the amount of time. It takes literally, um, you know, years or decades to, um, uh, to do certain types of medical, um, uh, medical research and development. Uh, AI can manage massive data sets, infinitely larger than what humans can juggle. Uh, what are we looking at here, guys? This is the inside of the sphere. You see all those people? Oh, yeah. They're yeah. watching a bunch of rockets take off. I don't know if this is the one that he was talking about, but... This combined with a good sound system creates a reality that's quite believable. Yeah. Very cool. All right, another article. Does AI need a body to become truly intelligent? Well, meta-researchers think so. They say we may be on the brink of finally seeing human-level intelligence in AI thanks to robots. AIs that can generate videos, quickly translate languages, or write new computer code could be world-changing, but can they ever be truly intelligent is the question. Well, not according to the embodiment hypothesis, which argues that human-level intelligence can only emerge if an intelligence is able to sense and navigate a physical environment the same way that babies can. Now, I might take issue with this. I mean, there's human intelligence and there's going to be machine intelligence. And although they may be different, I'm not sure that the machine has to go through the same trials and tribulations that humans do to gain knowledge, wisdom, and uh, learn to avoid objects, basically, on this planet. But let's stay with the article here. According to this theory, and the theory, again, is for those of you that didn't get it the first time, embodiment hy hypothesis the need for robots uh, and AI to merge in order to become truly intelligent. According to this theory, the only way to get an AI to develop true intelligence is to give it a body and the ability to move around and experience the world. Digital-only AIs, in comparison, may be great for narrow tasks, but they'll always hit an intelligence ceiling. Opinion, all right? They say AI systems that lack physical embodiment can never be truly intelligent, according to Akshara Rai. He's a research scientist at Meta. To fully comprehend the world, it's essential to interact with it and observe the outcome of those interactions. Picture a toddler falling over things, trying to climb steps, for example. Even get off the bed. My little 14-month-old is finally at a point where to get off the bed, she realizes she's got to flip around, do a 180, and let the feet go first. If the head goes first, there's going to be a lump on the, you know, on the head. Um, they say not all AI developers buy into this embodiment hypothesis, and it may end up being possible to create digital-only superintelligence that never feels the earth beneath its robotic feet. Many of those who do, though, are focused on figuring out the safest, most efficient way to let AIs explore the physical world. But simply dropping untrained AI brains into robot bodies is not it, according to this article. All right. Um, then they talk about the not-so-real world. Babies make a lot of mistakes when they're first learning to do something. And AI is likely to experience plenty of errors during training, too. If it's controlling a machine when it makes those errors, it could destroy the hardware, damage the world around it, or maybe even hurt people. Think of industrial robots that are operating in yeah. a manufacturing facility, swinging heavy stuff around and uh, not uh, being coordinated. That could cause a lot of collateral damage. I'm sure Tesla is doing that now with their Optimus, oh, testing, totally, yeah. doing the testing and stuff. When I was in the, um, uh, the Lucid plant here in uh, Casa Grande, um, massive uh, production plant with a lot of robotics, industrial robots, not humanoid. Um, there were very strict protocols regarding human access to any of these machines or these robots that were designed to do industrial robotics type uh, assembly work. Humans couldn't enter. In fact, there were even uh, facial recognition monitors and, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, the sensors and uh, all of that to, if there was any breach, it would shut down the machine. 
So they say an AI might need to attempt something many times before figuring out how to do it reliably. Multiply that by all the slightly different tasks we may want AI robots to be able to do, and the training period could become interminable. Computer simulations that mimic the environment and, and, and embodied AI is likely to encounter in the real world are a way to get around some of these problems, they're saying. What would we use it for, Pete? What would we use it for here? GMC, yeah. If we, if we had access to, like, Optimus or they gave us one to test. I usually do a walk around in the call centers here, you know, to greet the people and uh, let them know I'm, I'm around, I'm visible, and uh, give yeah. them a pep talk, basically. Well, I did that this morning. One of the new sales reps on the floor in the call center um, told me that she watches some of these, these uh, podcasts, and uh, we talked about that a bit. And mm -hmm. she... She said to me with a very earnest look on her face, she says, do you think that AI is going to replace us? Huh. You had to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> not, not this week. Don't worry about it. Not this, this, this week. Month. That's a good yeah, answer. Right, yeah. Not <laughs> anytime soon, maybe. You know, again, the point is we're going to all have to acquire new skills. And um, it, that may be a benefit, you know. Um, but... Um, AI and that type of technology is infiltrating everywhere, and uh, you're probably not aware that it's already beginning to take jobs uh, in functions that you were used to. Banking, for example, uh, research, uh, those are the things that we don't see. Joseph Liss says, RoboCop. Yeah, well, there's the Hollywood version of that. And that's one of the reasons people are so terrified of these new technologies. It's because Hollywood has played on our fears. Mm. And I understand why it sells tickets. If you're scared of something, you're going to go, how bad could this be? I, 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 I got to go check this out, right? Not to nitpick here, but I'm pretty sure RoboCop is they took a police officer who's on the verge of death and put his brain into a robot. So it wasn't AI. But oh, good point. Yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, he had human characteristics. He, he just had an exoskeleton. Yeah, they just put him in there to keep him alive. Right. Okay. All right. So, um, got an image we want to pop up here. It's called Free AI. For those of you that uh, don't want to pay some of these subscriptions, and by the way, they're not, uh, you know, unbearable. Mid Journey, I think, is twenty, thirty dollars a month or something like that. If you want to generate images, if you want the advanced version of OpenAI's Chat GPT four, what is it, twenty dollars a month or something? But they're free yeah. versions. Three point five, I believe, is free. And with this image that we're going to pop up... You don't you, even need an account anymore for ChatGPT. Oh, you don't? Yeah, they, okay. they changed that actually yesterday where you just go to the website and 3.5 comes up and you can start talking to it right away for free without an account. You know, that is so astonishing to me because anything that becomes popular is generally heavily monetized. Look at mm -hmm. what pharma has done, you know, the big drug companies. Yep. Um, Anyway, that's a whole nother rant. I won't get into that. <laughs> so here's your paid and free. And if you, you can see the, um, uh, the programs and uh, what it does and the capabilities and what you can do on the right there to uh, get a free version of that. Mid-Journey. I never heard of Blue Willow. You guys ever use that? Is it comparable? or? I have not used that one. I've not heard of that. Some of these are much smaller. I mean, except for uh, Eleven Labs, I've heard of that one, and Google uh, Bard, obviously, which is now Gemini. Right, right, yes. And 11 Labs is pretty impressive. Are we using it yet in our videos? Uh, we, we've we tested it out quite a bit, and we've gotten it to replicate your voice pretty closely. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what we're going to do now, actually, is we're waiting on the full rollout of uh, OpenAI just re did their voice uh, cloning. Mm -hmm. So as soon as that comes out, we're going to test that. But, I mean, we could use it at any time. We just, we just haven't used it yet. But we have your cloned voice ready to go in, in 11 Labs. So, folks, within a couple of years, what you see here right now, the, um, the audio, the visual, could be replaced by an avatar. The audio, of course, would be uh, identical to what I'm doing now because those large language models are going to be able to replicate perfectly. And, uh, you know, that just brings something else to mind. Um, Stand-up comedians doing, uh, doing impersonations. Um, Stand-up? Yeah, yes, yeah, stand-up comedians. Um, that would be um, a perfect application for this type of technology. But the problem now becomes, is it no longer believable because it's so perfect? And are people looking for those imperfections to make it entertaining and, and interesting? There's a whole uh, psychological factor there that uh, may 
be revealed as the technology Im- improves. So I'm just wondering what you mean, though. So if people would be at a stand-up show live? So picture um, uh, um, of The Tonight Show, right? Johnny Carson, way before your time, I understand, <laughs> right? So he brings out somebody that does impersonations, Jim Carrey, for example. Yeah. And he wants him to do um, Clint Eastwood, right? Well, yep. What makes it funny, I think, is that you see Jim Carrey, you're amazed at his contortions that he's able to... Uh, kick into play to become somewhat a reasonable facsimile of Clint Eastwood. What if that voice and those and those mannerisms and those contortions, facial contortions, were so perfect that it looked like Clint Eastwood? It it takes away the entertainment value, does it not? And all you'd see is you'd see Jim Carrey's face, you'd see Clint Eastwood, and then you would see Jim's again. And it's not quite as uh, believable. That's a good point. Uh, Anyway. We can go down these type of rabbit holes. Um, yeah, that'd be, that'd be it, interesting to see how they uh, use that, especially for stuff like crowd work, too. There's a comedian on Instagram that does that. He does um, these little bits about Biden and Ben, uh, is it Ben Shapiro? The Shapiro, yeah. Shapiro. Tucker Carlson yeah. would be a good one, Tar- too. He does yeah. Tucker Carlson, too, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, a bunch of, a bunch of celebrities oh, that, <laughs> that he does. But what he does is he distorts the face yeah. and enhances the facial features even more. So they're blown out of proportion. So it they're funnier. So, like, you know, Arnold, he has that, like, crazy face when he gets mad or something yeah. it's even more distorted <laughs> or blown out so it looks funnier um when you know he's talking so so like a caricature of the individual in their facial features accentuating their their um their mannerisms i guess yeah you know? like he yeah. he always makes biden look like more of a zombie or more out of it than than right. you know he really is he always makes ben shapiro sound like right. he's you know more analytical and crazy talking and fast talking than what he really is and mm-hmm. i think that's the beauty of the comedy they enhance their little quirks you know and and blow it up a little bit more and that's where the humor and the entertainment lies yeah and again, AI is going to have difficulty with that unless it's got a biofeedback track and it's able to actually zero in on what's going to make you laugh the most. I mean, they're already curating, like you said, on Facebook. The, you know, they're, they're showing you what it thinks you want to see or TikTok. Well, there's another thing, too. The, the Apple ear pods, you know, the little wireless ones yeah. that you go stick in your ear? They're not like over the ear. They're the, the little insert buds. Yeah, they kind of hang down a little bit. Apple, this was on the news a couple weeks ago. They submitted a patent... To use that, uh, the, to have little sensors in the earbud that would read your biofeedback and be able to give you your heart rate, your your breath control, all that stuff. Right. It, apparently, in the ear, there's a uh, way to put sensors in there, and they figured it out to where it's just like how I have my Apple Watch on. It's reading my my steps that I take. It's reading my heart rate, all that stuff. So they can do all of that biofeedback through your earbuds. Amazing. So imagine walking into a comedy show in the future yeah. where it's nothing but a screen, <laughs> You put in your everybody puts in their earbuds and it they do they tell exactly how you're responding to the show, and then the AI reacts to that or something along those lines. And they would get a level of cooperation because the people really do want the maximum amount of entertainment. So they would gladly wear these to provide and train the LLM or mm-hmm. whatever is doing the learning to zero in on what you like and don't like. Yeah, uh, folks, this is a fascinating technology. Um, So here's another headline. A third of Americans have never heard of ChatGPT. This was astonishing. And this is according to Pew Research, which is a well-known U.S.-based research uh, organization. They say um, use among uh, younger U.S. adults has ticked up 10 percentage points since July of last year, according to Pew Research, though 34 percent of respondents said they've never heard anything about ChatGPT. Despite all the hype surrounding ChatGPT, most U.S. adults still aren't using the AI chatbot, again, according to Pew. They said that over 10,000 people surveyed last month, they found that only 23% of U.S. adults have ever used GPT or ChatGPT. And uh, although that is an increase from July of last year, about an 18% increase. So it's increasing, but not as rapidly as people might have thought. All right, we've got some uh, quotes on AI replacing jobs. This is according to Kevin Drum. He says, sometime in the next 40 years, robots are going to take your job. I don't care what your job is. If you dig ditches, a robot will dig them better. If you're a magazine writer, 
a robot will write your article better. If you're a doctor, IBM's Watson will no longer assist you in finding the right diagnosis from its database of millions of case studies and journal articles. It will just be a better doctor than you. Good point. Then they say, as wages increase and the price of technology decreases, the decision to invest in robotics and automation becomes much easier to justify because of the high return on investment. Here's another one. If manufacturing jobs do come back to the U.S., they will be done by robots in high-tech parts of the country rather than in Rust Belt states. Did you guys get too cold? We're not saying anything. <laughs> not saying a word. <laughs> These guys like turning on the air conditioner and freezing me out. You know, this time of year, you can just open that front door. Yeah, right? well, we usually, we like to turn it on in the afternoon for the new Calm podcast, and then yeah. sometimes it gets hot for Janie's podcast. But All right. Here's another one by Dave Waters. This guy gets quoted a lot. I don't even know who he is or where he's from. Who? Dave Waters. Uh, let me take a look. It's probably curated because every Facebook... Um, each Facebook session I go into has some quote from Dave Waters, his picture, and then... Uh, but anyway, what he says is, should people be scared about losing their jobs to automation and artificial intelligence? Well, instead of being afraid, he suggests, I would say people should put that energy into improving their skill sets so that if their job is lost to automation, they're prepared for their next level or their second act. I would just amend that and say when. There's, it's not an if. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's one from Tim Urban. He says, first, stop thinking of robots. A robot is a container for AI, sometimes mimicking the human form, sometimes not, but the AI itself is the computer inside the robot. AI is the brain and the robot is its body, even if it has, even if it has a body. Good point. <clears throat> All right, OpenAI debuts voice cloning tech, but won't release it widely. Um, and we talked about this earlier, things like Eleven Labs, uh, learning how your voice operates. The technology can clone a person's voice using only a 15 second audio clip. I think Eleven Labs took a bit longer than that, did it not? Yeah, well, so for their one that's um, that Farzad, <coughs> excuse me, Mesbahi uses, it takes three hours. You need three hours of footage. Three hours, okay. To get it to where it sounds as close to possible, to the and, person as possible. And he's and he's loving it because it gets him out of the um, stuttering phase and the oohs and ahs that, uh, you know, I do a lot of ah, well, you know, it eliminates all of that. The problem is with a podcast like this, you're not going to have a visual attached to it, so it's nothing but B-rolls. Mm. Because we don't have the avatar connection to the eleven labs or to the to the narrative yet, but it's coming and it's coming rapidly. So will my job be replaced? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's coming for it's coming for everything. Me. Um, they say that uh, for now, OpenAI is only releasing this voice engine to select partners. Um, and they say that uh, the company has developed this voice cloning technology that's so good, it's bound to both impress and scare users, but for now, very few will be released or very few uh, sessions or versions will be released. It says that in addition, talking about now its capabilities, after 15 seconds of listening to some clips of you talking, the replicated voice can, can convey emotion and the natural cadence of human speech, making the AI-generated dialogue sound realistic. They first developed this, by the way, in 2022, and uh, rather than release the entire um, capability to the public, the company has essentially decided that society isn't quite ready for it, at least not yet. Okay, so let's uh, have a little bit of a rabbit hole here. All right. What else are they holding back? Is that where you're going with this? <laughs> right? Well, they're definitely holding back some stuff, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm more on the side of when is reality going to... We're, we're not far from reality... We, we're not going to be able to distinguish reality. If you, Undistinguishable, if yeah. If it's, if it's a real... We get to a point where it just takes a few seconds of capturing somebody to replicate them entirely. Well, I mean, we're a few... Maybe a few months, a few years, who knows, but... All I can say is we're going to be very confused because yeah. we won't be able to distinguish. In fact, the next headline here is video games are approaching perfect photorealism. Mm-hmm. 
Platforms like Unreal Engine 5 are enabling independent developers to create hyper-realistic digital worlds. Um, you know, I've got six kids. Some of them still play video games into their adult life. And they literally immerse themselves in this alternate reality. And it becomes very real from them. My 12-year-old granddaughter, since she was little, complains about dad in his study where he's got his gigantic screen playing video games, uh, teaching her all of the cuss words under the sun. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'm trying to find some, uh, some videos so they can see what sure. we're talking about with the photorealism. It's pretty crazy. Here's a good one. This is a video game. Look at the light. Boy, this is the far cry from adventure back in the 70s and Wolfenstein in the 80s. I don't play video games anymore anyway, but we, we had things in the 70s on mainframes called uh, Lunar Lander was one, special monitor. You couldn't just use a, a dumb monitor for that. And then adventure was all text-based. Yeah, so that's one of them. I'll see if I can find any other ones, but that's... That's crazy real. Yeah, it's pretty realistic. Even the debris on the ground, yeah. Now, you combine that with olfactory uh, sensors. Oh, here's... And uh, we're able to, you know, smell the mustiness in those uh, um, industrial buildings and... Now, here's the one that I showed you a while ago that's indistinguishable for me. You said you had seen some a few things, Pete, but this looks just straight up real to me. That's completely fake. And this is AI. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is Unreal Engine. This is somebody doing development in Unreal Engine. Like, if we zoom in on the, I won't let me zoom, but that fire and smoke in yeah. the street and all this is entire everything is completely fake and rendered in. Even the way it's dissipating, thinning perhaps a bit too rapidly, uh, but uh, again, the um, the type of havoc that something like this could wreak is um is frightening and scary you know again headline could be another tesla model s catches fire on the streets of right. whatever right exactly and the next thing you know uh news media they plagiarize they pick up and suddenly this thing just goes viral mm -hmm. it swarms and that's the thing if something goes viral fast enough where people don't know like it could be a fake terrorist attack well, yeah, yeah, you're going a whole different direction. And now. nobody knows until it's too late, and we've already responded. Those are the ones we don't want to talk about because we don't want to give the terrorists any ideas, right? At least that's the strategy behind it. Um, all right, we've got the headline, actually, that uh, is the picture behind me. We should probably talk about that before we close out here. Um, AI robots are revolutionizing agriculture, is this headline. And the Dutch tulip industry, famous for its colorful fields that draw tourists from around the world, are exploring the wider impact of AI on farming. So this... This big robot is called Theo. It's a boxy robot. It works tirelessly across tulip fields to identify and eliminate diseased bulbs, showcasing the application of AI and precision agriculture. The uh, Theo works every day. It's crazy efficient. It works including weekends, nights, and it never grumbles. Mm -hmm. it, they don't say this. It never asks for a raise. It has no interpersonal relationship problems, um, and it doesn't take sick days, bathroom breaks, vacations. It just tirelessly works. And this is in the Dutch tulip fields, checking for diseased flowers, tasks that would normally, and here's the benefit now. Yes, it did replace some jobs, but listen to the rest of this. A task that would normally cause a lot of back pain for farm workers. Can you imagine? I mean, you've seen them in the fields, right? Even, uh, you know, pulling onions, for example. Um, there's a lot of back-breaking work there because you're constantly hunched over. Machines like this remove all of that uh, physical, um, uh, um, uh, those physical ailments. They say it's a technological transformation, uh, transformation with 45 robots deployed across the Netherlands. This initiative marks a significant shift toward technology-driven solutions in combating plant disease, specifically the tulip-breaking virus. 
Uh, we've seen robots that pick uh, raspberries, yeah. pick apples. And uh, I mean, this is a visual process as well. You have to be able to decide whether that apple is red enough, whether it has a wormhole on the side. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's probably all kinds of things that it can look for. Well, if that, if AI, if it uses like, I don't know, infrared or something, it could see the worms inside, even if there are no Good point, visible yeah. holes that we could see as humans, right? Yeah. So you'd be able to tell them much and more the, accurately. The physical characteristics of these robots can be adapted to the application. If you think about it, for humans to do this type of work, they're going up on ladders, highly unsafe, right? Cherry pickers, very expensive, diesel yep. fuel, all of that. You just make a 30-foot robot, and it can do this effortlessly. So you design the, the, the technology to the application, basically. Mm -hmm. Generational shift in farming, they say. Farming shifting landscape merges old roles such as sickness spotters with new tech transitioning to AI robots. And why does this matter? Well, innovation in agriculture drives down price. It uh, makes it more affordable. Um, they also talk about uh, greater yields because of the, um, uh, the disease prevention. Um, economic considerations, there's an investment in the technology, granted, but despite the high cost, it reflects a strategic approach to sustaining and enhancing agricultural productivity with potential implications for economic viability of traditional farming practices. Boy, there's a mouthful. Huh. Um, so this narrative opens up discussions on the ethical considerations and sustainability of integrating AI into traditional sectors examining the balance between, well, it goes on and on and on. All right, here's another one. Humanoid robots are joining the Mercedes-Benz workforce. Um, Joseph Liss says, looks like a body cam on a cop. Group yeah, for that video we showed. Oh, oh, for the video, okay. Yeah, I have the rest of that video too when you're done with your uh, news. All right. So um, it turns out Mercedes-Benz is uh, introducing humanoid robots in Hungary, not in the U.S. or in Germany yet anyway. The automaker will deploy Aptronics Apollo robots in Hungary, and um, the workers at the plant will soon be joined on the factory floor by these Apollos, which are designed to take over dull, repetitive, and physically demanding tasks. I'm sure that this is what the HR department is uh, uh, telling the employees at these locations. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, and there's a picture of it carrying something that could be backbreaking work. Perfect example. The workers of the future, they say, car manufacturing has long been at the forefront of industrial robots, but traditionally, manufacturers have had to design a new robot for every task they wanted to automate. One robot might weld two parts over and over and over again, for example, and another might move parts from one assembly line to another. Humanoid robots are different. They can upend this paradigm, they say, because they are by definition modeled after the human body. One robot could potentially carry out many different tasks currently handled by human workers. Yeah, thanks for that image. That's perfect. All right, we're coming up uh, 12 minutes past. Was there anything else you guys wanted to present? In yeah, this I have the, the video for the, the full video of the... And remember, this says that this was posted by Barstool Game Time on April 19th of last year. This is a year old. Really? And this is the video that straight up made me think we're already in a simulated reality. <laughs> so watch this. This is the rest of that uh, body cam video. And it's all completely AI. Amazing. The graffiti even looks um, realistic. AI and Unreal Engine. And you said this was a video game or just a video? This is a video game. Video game? Okay. Yeah, this is a, a video game that's uh, still coming out. Oh, there goes a guy. All right. That must be a bad guy. He's running away. Shots fired! Shots fired! Smoke coming off of the gun barrel. Are we counting the bullets to make sure it's realistic? I will. Uh, 
Keep in mind, this is a video game. There's not footage. It's a video game. I'm continuously keeping that in mind. The degree of realism is uh, breathtaking. The theme, of course, is disappointing. The boomer generation in me wants to say, we're teaching our kids how to become effective killers and desensitizing them to uh, this kind of brutality. And we all wonder, for my generation at least, where will it take us? What will happen as we become desensitized? That's a good question. You know? It's a very good question, actually. But there's been a lot of... Uh studies done on whether video games increase violence and it actually doesn't as far as all of the stuff that I've read it just makes them better killers um, Unrecord yeah. is the name of the game so, so there you have it technology is uh, definitely continuing its uh, rapid progression it's going to be another week and next week I'm sure we'll have all kinds of new things to report and one thing is, you know, when we were at Bitfire, you remember Bitfire Studios, obviously, where they had the screens and yeah. they could do the crazy um, like TV screen where we were standing on it. Three-dimensional behind Th us, yeah. That is all powered by Unreal. So they can put you in that environment in, in like a Bitfire-type studio. So that's something we can work towards as well, where it's the whole new generation of green screen, like what we use for what's behind you now. Yeah, yeah. You know, we don't get a lot of comments on our videos. Um, and we don't understand why, but, uh, you know, we think they're good videos. But anyway, if you have any suggestions, you would like the, um, the AI show to continue to go more interactive like we did this morning, let us know. Uh, or let us know what you'd like to see more of or less of. And, and uh, we'll, we'll try to accommodate that. Again, thank you for joining us. It's been a fun hour, and uh, we'll see you next week.